So we are going to go about 25 to 30 minutes with Dwayne Bratt here. A lot of you who have been several times will know that Dwayne is a, he's been here a few times. I think I've introduced him three times. Um, the, the, the topic is the campaign results and aftermath of the 2023 election. Um, I, I noticed a few people wore black appropriately. I actually picked the only black shirt I own out. Um, the funereal Paul of this presentation, hopefully Dwayne will crack some jokes and make us all feel a little better. <laughs> Uh, Dwayne, uh, Dwayne, thankfully, just to ensure that we sold a lot, of, that, we, that we got a lot of seats, that we sold a lot of food, Dwayne went viral last night. Um, one of Danielle Smith's PR people decided to refer to him as an NDP partisan and alleged political scientist. Well, I'm going to tell you something about Dwayne Bratt. I have listened to Dwayne Bratt for a long time in interviews, uh, in everything he says. He is a nonpartisan political scientist who does an excellent job of analyzing and breaking down elections for us. I, I mean, at least three times, every time he's appeared at SACPA, he has given us a very balanced take on things. Uh, he works, he doesn't just do SACPA, just for those wondering. I believe he's in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal in Calgary. It's not a great city, but I hear Mount Royal's a pretty good institution. <laughs> so we're gonna cut him some slack. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting on the campaign results and aftermath of the 2023 election, I'm going to introduce Dwayne Bratt. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I am indeed not uh, an ADP partisan, nor am I a conservative partisan or a liberal partisan. But if... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm going to have to yell? Okay, use my gym voice. Um, but if you disagree with what I have to say, then I'm obviously a partisan for the other side. As far as being an alleged political scientist, um, my check still clears. Um, so I'm still being paid, so I think that is, uh, that is important and, and useful. Um, I've spoken here many, many times, but I think this is the first time in a couple of years. Um, I didn't come down in, in 2020 or 2021 or 2022, uh, but I spoke anyway uh, from the comfort of my um, uh, home office, and I'm pretty sure I wore pants while I did it. Um, any evidence to the contrary is, is a lie. Um, so I wanted to talk about the Alberta election. Before I do that, uh, a little uh, PR plug. Uh, I did edit a new book on the Kenny government. You may recall Jason Kenny. He was premier uh, in 2019. Uh, he didn't last the full four years, uh, but it's a really interesting story of why he didn't. And I did bring copies of that, that book if anyone is interested in purchasing, and I can sign them at the, the back when we're, we're done. Uh, it's called The Blue Storm. It was the sequel to our book on the Notley government called The Orange Chinook, uh, and we're currently pitching ideas for the title of Volume 3 on the Smith government. Uh, it needs a color, and it needs a weather pattern, uh, and then a colon, and we'll figure it out after that. So we don't know the color. I'm thinking tornado as the uh, weather pattern, uh, but I'm also hoping it will just be calm sailing. I. Um, one of the interviews I gave, my advice was be boring. We need some boring Alberta politics, uh, but based on last night, I don't think we're going to be in a boring situation. So let's talk about the election results. So the first is Daniel Smith. And just to put this into context, I've known Daniel a very long time. In fact, in the, I worked for Global on election night in the Big Four building. Uh, I didn't show you my picture because it was far at the back and she was small. I used the, the front row picture. But at the 2019 election, I was also working for Global next to Ryan Jesperson and Daniel Smith. So the joke in 2023 is which of the four of us on the panel is going to be the next Premier of Alberta. Uh, it was uh, Darren Billis of the NDP, Leela here of the UCP, myself and Jason Ribeiro of the Calgary Economic Development. And the consensus is none of the four of us will be the next Premier, but Dalex Flexhog, who hosted it, who works for Global, will be. So uh, <laughs> given that Danielle also worked for Global, that seems to make as much sense as, as any of it. The reason I put this up there 
is I think Smith winning the election is the conclusion of the biggest political comeback in Canadian history. This was a woman who was fired from the Calgary Board of Education, becomes Wild Rose leader, uh, leads in the polls in the 2012 election until the very end and loses, then crosses the floor in 2014 and loses the PC nomination in early 2015 and is in political purgatory. And yet somehow rehabilitates her image, rehabilitates her political career, wins the leadership of the UCP, becomes Premier of the province, and then wins a majority government. Uh, this is a story of like, uh, I can't even uh, uh, imagine um, occurring for anybody else. So we do need to recognize what a remarkable political comeback that was. So let's talk about the campaign. I'm going to begin by using some political science terms about sword and shield issues. Um, sword issues are offensive issues for a party. These are issues that a party thinks it can win on. These are issues that traditionally that party wins on in public opinion polls. Shield issues are defensive issues. These are issues that they're weak on, but they need to have something uh, for a serious series of, of talking points. So an illustration outside of Alberta would be the 2021 campaign where Aaron O'Toole, the Conservative leader, came up with a price on carbon. It was complicated, it was confusing, he wanted to be able to have a carbon tax without calling it a carbon tax, but the idea was it would take the issue of climate change off the agenda and buffer the Conservatives. And I think he was quite effective at, at doing that. That's what we call a shield issue. Um, a sword issue is when you attack the, the other side. So the UCP had some swords. The first was, on day one of the official campaign, they announced a billion dollar tax cut. They were going to continue the fuel tax um, suspension throughout 2023 and a major tax reduction for any of those making less than $60,000. It works out to be about a billion dollars. Typically, conservative parties uh, win on issues of taxation, and so therefore this was a, a sword issue. Then she went further by pledging that she would enshrine these tax cuts by making it a requirement to have a referendum to increase taxes in Alberta. Already we have the Taxpayer Protection Act, which was introduced by Ralph Klein, that says there has to be a referendum on a um, by bringing in a provincial sales tax. What she wants to do is extend that to any increase in corporate or personal tax rates. This was designed to hurt the end and to say, not only am I promising a billion dollars, I'm trying to make sure that no future government could do so. Um, we can debate the policies of this. Uh, the California has this, and, and California is in a fiscal mess. But from a political perspective, it's a pretty powerful argument. Because guess what? We don't like taxes. We don't like paying taxes. Low taxes are good. Now, we also like high social spending, uh, but we also don't like taxes. So this was politically powerful. Another issue was crime. Typically, conservative governments win on law and order issues, crime issues. Now, crime wasn't a major issue in the campaign when people were asked, but the, the Conservatives spent a lot of time trying to make it one, um, talking about transit issues in downtown Calgary and Alberta and rural crime issues, and therefore she used um, uh, Rebecca Schultz, uh, a newly elected Calgary MLA, uh, younger, a suburban mom from South Calgary to promote this crime agenda. She used Mike Ellis, the public safety minister and former cop, to walk the streets of Calgary. They stepped on transit, and so crime was a sword issue. Then they wanted to focus Notley, who is personally popular in Alberta, with Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh, who are not popular. Um, and so they called it the Notley Singh Trudeau Alliance. This is an extension of what Jason Kenney did in 2019. Jason Kenney talked about the Trudeau Notley Alliance, uh, but Smith added Jagmeet Singh because if anything, Singh is even more unpopular in Alberta than Justin Trudeau. And they tried to say that because if you're a member of the provincial NDP and a federal NDP, that that meant Jagmeet Singh was the boss of Rachel Notley. That's not true. 
He's not the boss. They're just members of the same party. In fact, conservative, federal conservatives campaigned as much for their provincial cousins as the NDP did, if not more. But it made a great talking point. And you saw the ads where they would show Trudeau saying Notley. I had a campaign lawn sign on my block that said, you know, stop Trudeau um, by defeating Notley. Uh, so they made that clear, clear link. And they had very successful negative ads on Notley's economic record as Premier. When you watch the debate, you would have thought Rachel Notley was the incumbent Premier. And there was a lot of focus on her economic record of 2015 to 2019, which were really bad economic times in this province. And you could argue it was the price of oil or macroeconomic conditions. None of that matters. If you lost your job or you lost your business in 2017 or 2018, you may have forgotten what the reasons were, but you don't forget who was in office at that time. And so that was a very powerful uh, attack ad. Um, and in fact, in the, in the post-election analysis, they've been giving a lot of credit to, to Smith by saying you know, to her advisors, I'm running on my record, why doesn't Rachel Notley run on her record? It sounded like an epiphany, except of course the attack ads on Notley had already been, been out. Um, so those are the sword issues. But the NDP had some, or sorry, the UCP had some weaknesses, so they needed shield issues. Most notably education and healthcare, which are typically owned by the NDP. So what did they do? They had a great budget. A budget, because the price of oil was so high, they could have the largest spending budget in Alberta's history, which it was. In fact, I called it an NDP budget. It made it very difficult for the NDP to criticize, and at one point, when the NDP was trying to figure out how to do it, I think it was Sarah Hoffman who said, I think you're spending too much money. That didn't work well coming from the NDP. Um, and uh, then there was a big news conference where they announced a public health guarantee. Similar to Jason Kenney signing the big card of a public health guarantee. The NDP doesn't need to have a press conference saying we support public health care because they are seen as the defenders of public health care. The UCP did, particularly Daniel Smith, because in the 20 years prior to becoming Premier had articulated all sorts of private health care schemes uh, and then reversed herself to, to public health care. Now I think it is you can have a legitimate conversation about who should administer hospitals, uh, what sort of services should be privatized. After all, doctor's offices are private, dental care is private, optometrists are, are private, but that's not what she ran on. She ran on public health care. Um, and so that was seen as a shield, a realization that Albertans like public health care, therefore the UCP was going to protect it. Um, they de-emphasized it because it wasn't a sword issue, but they needed to have a health care strategy because it's a, a, a shield. The NDP, what was their sword? Can you trust Danielle Smith? That was in fact the major thrust of their entire campaign and quite frankly Danielle Smith helped them out by providing lots and lots and lots of video evidence um, and s not all of it occurred as a talk show host. Not all of it occurred as Wild Rose leader. Some of these videos, like saying the unvaccinated were the most discriminated in her lifetime, or comparing those who did get vaccinated with supporters of Hitler, or why she doesn't wear a poppy because she was upset with the government, those were all as Daniel Smith was premier. And so issues about Smith and can you trust Smith was the major thrust of the NDP campaign. Then you have the Ethics Commissioner's report which broke down in the middle of the campaign which said Daniel Smith interfered in the judicial system. And in fact, Marguerite Tressler called it a threat to democracy by A, accepting a phone call with Art Puzlowski. Um, who was facing uh, charges for coots and was going to trial weeks after the phone call. Um, for those outside of Calgary, 
uh, I will let, just let you know, in my view, he is a horrible human being. He, he really is. He blamed the Calgary floods. We just had the 10th anniversary of that on gays in Calgary. Um, and uh, he regularly has demonstrations outside of, of uh, City Hall uh, with a megaphone and breaks all sorts of bylaws. And what he was charged with was inciting violence at, at Coots. Just uh, no premier. No minister, no chief of staff should ever take a phone call from him. Um, then she calls Tyler Shandro hours after the justice minister to say, is there anything you can do? Can you kind of help the guy out? Uh, and Shandro, to his credit, said this is an inappropriate call. Please don't call again. Uh, this drops in the middle of the campaign. So. The issue of trust on Smith was a major attack by the NDP, and they linked it with health care by showing some of those clips where she talked about a health care savings account. Uh, Nathan Newdorf, uh, the Lethbridge MLA, said Why, you sh we should be charging people to go to emergency departments. Um, so there was issues around private health care. The NDP frequently attacked that. But the NDP also had to be defensive on budget. After all, they ran large budget deficits when they were in government, and therefore, as a shield, they hired Todd Hirsch. Uh, Todd Hirsch was the former chief economist of the Alberta Treasury branch, very well-respected economist. He drafted up a report, talked about how they were going to balance the budget, how they were going to put money in the Heritage Trust Fund, and I think that was used as a shield. And they also promised the elimination of the small business tax. Um, so those were all shield mechanisms to protect them on the tax issues. So those are the sword and shield issues um, and basically the UCP said that what they wanted people to vote on was the economy, they wanted people to vote on oil and gas sector, if you dislike Trudeau vote for us and if you're worried about the budget under Notley vote for us. The NDP was if you like public health care, vote for us. And if you don't trust Daniel Smith, vote for us. So there was no single ballot box question. Instead, each party wanted different questions to the electorate. Well, okay, what were the results? Well, the seat count on election night was 49-38, but one of those UCP members, Jennifer Johnson over Lacombe Pinoca, is having to sit as an independent because she said some very controversial things, comparing trans children to pieces of excrement, and therefore uh, Smith said she would not be welcome in caucus. So it's actually 48-38. That's a 10-seat gap. That is the lowest margin of victory in Alberta's history. Um, Alberta doesn't have close elections. Uh, we've never had a minority government since, uh, in our, since 1905, and we don't have a minority government now. But the l l smallest gap between the first place party and the second place party was 15 seats. This is 10 or 11 seats, depending on how you want to count. On the popular vote, uh, the UCP got 52.6, the NDP got 44, again a very small margin uh, compared to previous elections. And this is the largest opposition we, we have seen. In fact, this is the best result the NDP's ever had from a popular vote perspective, even more so than when they formed government in 2015. Voter turnout dropped, which is surprising in a tight election, but I think there's an explanation of why voter turnout dropped. Um, and it dropped eight points from 2019. But 2019 was the largest turnout since the early 80s. And 2023 was the second largest. So 59.5 looks bad in comparison to 2019, but it was higher than 2015, it was higher than 2012, and in 2018, when Ed Stelmack won a large majority, 40% of Albertans voted. Uh, so that gives you a sense of, of where we are. But the seat count doesn't do it justice. You have to visualize it with the map. We often refer to Alberta politics as a three-legged stool. And it's become a bit of a trope, but it's still realistic. And the tradition is a party needs to win two out of the three legs. They have to win Edmonton, they have to win Calgary, and the rest of Alberta. And you've got to win two out of the three. The current government is the first government ever, ever, to form government and only win one leg of the stool.
Uh, but it's a really big lake. Uh, the rest of Alberta is 41 seats. They won 37 of those. 37 to 4 in the rest of Alberta is why they're there. And in Calgary, they lost, but it was narrow. It was 14 to 12. So that one's a bit saggy, uh, but Edmonton, they were shut out. So there's no leg there. So I wouldn't want to sit on that stool um, that is missing a leg, has one really long leg, and one that's a bit lopsided. Uh, but you can see the, the breakdown. Um, to give you a sense of how um, divided the province is, look at Lethbridge. Okay, half blue, half orange. I think that's pretty representative of uh, what, what occurred. Um, and so there's real challenges there. But let's break that down even more. So this is the vote count. So it's not just that Edmont or Edmonton went NDP. They won Edmonton by a lot. And you can see some of the vote totals there. So they won Edmonton Strathcona, which is Rachel Notley's riding, by over 10,000 votes. Okay? There were ridings that didn't have 10,000 people voting in them, uh, and yet Notley won by 10,000. But when you look at the UCP, there's about six or seven ridings in rural Alberta that they won by over 10,000 votes. Where it was was Battleground Calgary. I'm sure you're sick and tired of hearing that the election would be decided in Calgary. But guess what? The election was decided in Calgary. Uh, and the NDP has, has frequently said if 1,500 people had voted the different way in Calgary, in the right writings, um, that the NDP would have formed government. That is true. But that's really tough math to do. Conversely, if the UCP had gotten an extra 1,500 votes in the right ridings, they would have had like 54, 55 seats. So that's a mugs game to play. Well, yeah, if, uh, if, if that person had voted this way and that person had voted that way, we would have won. Yeah. Uh, and if we hadn't hit the goalpost and we hadn't met a hot goalie, the Toronto Maple Leafs would be Stanley Cup winners this year. <laughs> Uh, they didn't win the cup this year. Um, I'm a lifelong Leafs fan, and the big interest I have in the Stanley Cup playoffs is always, how are they going to break my heart this year? <laughs> we won the first round, then we had our parade. Um, most teams wait till they win the cup, but winning the first round was like winning the cup for us. <laughs> so there we go. Um, so. When we talk about the rest of the province, though, it's often said, well, it's rural Alberta. Well, Lethbridge isn't rural. Lethbridge is a mid-sized city. So I break it down. There are five mid-sized cities in Alberta. And they're geographically divided, right? So you've got Grand Prairie in the northwest. You've got Fort McMurray in the northeast. You've got Red Deer in central. You've got Lethbridge in the southwest, Medicine Hat in the southeast. That's 10 seats, roughly, in each of those five cities. 10 ridings in total. Uh, the UCP won nine. Uh, the only place the NDP won was, was Lethbridge West, which is a traditional non-conservative riding. After all, Bridget Pastor represented Lethbridge West for years as a liberal, and then Shannon Phillips took over for the, for the NDP. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I think this was an area that the, uh, the uh, NDP felt that they could win, had to win, they did not win. Um, then we've got what I call pure suburban ridings, and I only count two of those. Um, I count St. Albert and I count Sherwood Park. I spent a lot of time in Edmonton. I know when I moved from Edmonton to Sherwood Park because the Henday Highway is in between them, but quite frankly, I don't know when I've moved from Edmonton to St. Albert. I'm sure they do, um, but I can't tell. And both of those ridings went NDP, but there's only two of them. Then I call rural suburban ridings. These are areas that are partially suburban, like Strathcona, Sherwood Park, that has a foot in Sherwood Park, but a foot in the rural community outside, or Morinville, St. Albert, same sort of thing, or Chestermere, Strathmore, or Airdrie, Cochrane, or Airdrie East, or Banff, Kananaskis. Um, there's 10 of those and the UCP won nine, and the NDP won Banff, Kananaskis. Um, and so those are really split, split ridings. Uh, and then we've got what I call the pure rural ridings. You know, Tabor, Olds, Sundry, um, and there's 19 of those, and those weren't close at all, 19 to nothing. So I've broken down those 41 seats. 
there is the map. Now, a couple things to, to note on the Calgary map is how contiguous the NDP uh, seats are, right? They're all connected, Northeast Calgary, Northwest Calgary, and sort of the Beltline downtown area. Obviously, the further south you go, the more conservative it becomes, and on the west side. But you look at Calgary North, okay? The one that's kind of just sitting there, well, Mohammed Yassin won that by 113 votes. That shows you how tight it was. Uh, Calgary Northwest, Rajan Sani, 150 votes. And Rajan Sani, she made a pretty good bet. She had said, as the former cabinet minister, former MLA for Calgary Northeast, she wasn't going to run again. Okay. Then Sonia Savage, the energy and environment minister, decides not to run, and they parachute Sawney into Calgary Northwest, uh, and she barely wins Northwest. Had she been in Northeast, she would have lost her seat. Uh, and then we've got the really tight races of Calgary Glenmore and Ca Can uh, Calgary Acadia. The numbers I've got in there were before the recount. Post recount, uh, Acadia was won by 25 votes. Glenmore was won by 45 votes. So when you're told your votes don't matter, uh, tell that to Whitney Isaac and Tyler Shandro because I think they're going to be lying awake at night about how close those races were. Um, so that's the, that's the map of Calgary. And then that's the breakdown of all battleground Calgary. And you can see in there a lot of prominent ministers lost their jobs. Tyler Shandro, uh, Jason Copping, uh, Nick Milliken, he's in Calgary Curry, that's, that's my riding. Um, we're, all, uh, we're all defeated, okay. We often hear, um, you know, the polls were wrong, or polls are always wrong. Well, the polls weren't wrong in 2023. They all predicted a small UCP victory, but one pollster was better than them all. And so that's, that's Janet Brown. And I'm putting this up not just because Janet's a colleague and, and a friend, uh, but because she was almost exactly right. And when she released her poll, was relentlessly attacked by the NDP for being wrong. Um, and yet, you look at it, um, she was dead on at the provincial level, she was dead on at the Edmonton level, she was dead on in Calgary, and she was dead on in the rest of the province. That's a pretty accurate measure, and she also uses a different methodology than any other pollster. So uh, Janet also had the most accurate poll in 2019, and you couldn't live with her for four years after that. <laughs> uh, we're not gonna be able to live with Janet for four years after this uh, either, so. So how did this, how do we explain the results? I, I think on one hand, look at the vote share. The UCP held their vote share between 2019 and 2023. It dropped two and a half points. That's not very much, two and a half points. The end, what made it close was the NDP went from 33 to 44%. But they didn't take those votes away from the UCP. Instead, they took them away from the other parties, the Alberta Party, the Liberal Party, the Green Party. Someone needs to put the poor Alberta Liberals to bed. Um, and the biggest stat I can give is Art Puzlowski, you remember talking about Art Puzlowski's Solidarity Party got more votes than the Alberta Liberals did. So just think about that for a moment. Okay. Uh, the electoral strategy, Daniel Smith gave an interview with Rick Bell saying she didn't need to win the cities. All she had to do was hold rural Alberta and win a few seats uh, in Calgary. Um, and that's what she did. Um, meanwhile, the NDP's electoral math was very hard. They won Calgary, they swept Edmonton, but they needed to almost sweep Calgary if they weren't going to win seats in rural suburban and mid-sized cities. So the math was hard for the NDP. But I will also say, despite this being a major political comeback for Daniel Smith, the election was only close because of questions about her judgment and competency, especially in Calgary. There were people in Calgary who had voted conservative all their lives who simply said, I can't vote UCP this time. The default vote option for most Albertans 
outside of Edmonton, Edmonton's a separate matter, is to vote conservative. And it's not because we're necessarily conservative ideologically, we're conservative identifiably. And that's a distinction. And so in Calgary, in rural Alberta, we have voted conservative federally, provincially for decade after decade after decade. So that's your default vote option. I don't follow politics closely. I go to the election booth, I look for where the conservative name is, and I tick that off. The second is the economy had rebounded to where, compared to where it was in the early Kenny years or in the Notley years, and this allowed the UCP to spend heavily in pre-election budget. So typically when the economy is good, you vote for the incumbent, especially given the conservative identification of many Albertans. Ann Smith had a good debate performance. She didn't win the debate, but she didn't have to. She just had to overachieve expectations. And here I will paraphrase Corey Tenenke, who is a key strategist for Stephen Harper, who was debating Justin Trudeau in 2015. At the time, Harper was the incumbent prime minister. Trudeau is the challenger. Trudeau was seen as a lightweight. And Corey Tanaki goes on national TV and says all Trudeau has to do is show up to the debate wearing pants and he'll exceed expectations. And sure enough, when the debate occurred, Trudeau wore pants and he won the debate. So all Smith had to do is show up, look reasonable, look composed, look poised, looked on top of issues, and that's exactly what she did. And so a very strong debate performance by Smith. Notley, on the other hand, seemed to fumble at various times to get her voice out. <coughs> NDP promised to increase corporate taxes. Usually raising corporate taxes is popular. I mean, after all, we dislike paying taxes, but we like other people to pay taxes, particularly rich corporations, but it allowed the UCP to say, guess what? The NDP raised corporate taxes in 2015, and we had really bad economic times. That's going to lead to a lack of investment. That's going to be a lack of jobs. And so the UCP effectively turned that around, and that was a major mistake by the NDP. And the NDP had a very strong anti-Smith message but they didn't do a good enough job to promote a positive message. I'll give you one illustration. Before the writ was issued, they came up with the idea of free contraception. Great idea, great policy, not very expensive, very politically attractive, and yet they stopped talking about that, especially given that Smith criticized it by saying, no, that would be too expensive. We can't afford to give contraception uh, to, to women, uh, but we can you know, give money to Murray Edwards to build a hockey rink in Calgary. Um, but the NDP didn't talk about that. Instead, they just attacked Smith. Um, I'm being told I'm out of time, um, but that's okay. Um, I can talk later on about the four major challenges, I think, facing the Smith government, as well as a discussion on the, on the cabinet. Maybe those will come up in questions. So thank you all. All right, now we'll start our Q&A. Uh, just line up right here by the wall there. I see we've already got one lucky volunteer. Uh, when you step up to the microphone, our friend here at Shaw, we need first name, last name, then your question. Don't need a bio, don't need a personal history, first name, last name questions. So we're gonna kick up the Q&A. If anybody has a Q&A and they don't wanna come up and speak, just hand me the written question or whisper it in my ear. Hi, Leona Jacobs. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Um, Leona Jacobs. So just to begin, I have two things. One, just to begin, is to uh, correct you in terms of Lethbridge. Um, Lethbridge West was held by Clint Dunford, Greg Wiedek, Shannon Phillips. Okay. Lethbridge East, Ken Nickel, Bridget Pasteur, Maria Fitzpatrick, and now Nathan Newdorf. Okay. okay. So. It's joggled, um, and Lethbridge West was always a hard win. So, um, my question, and it's more to have you comment, is the role of the media. When I was out campaigning, canvassing, um, a lot of people said they talked about the the, the antagonism of the campaign, the mm -hmm. the Notley versus Smith credentialism. Mm -hmm. type, the Notley, this is, the Notley versus. Smith credentialism business and trustworthiness, but they said that nobody's talking about policy, and yet 
I was talking, like people were talking about policy, the NDP were talking about policy, the UCP were talking about policy, but that didn't seem to be picked up by the news media. And also the whole issue of the role of social media in this particular campaign, as we're four years down the road with a lot of hostility there. So. Okay. A um, couple things. First is uh, the media is getting weaker and weaker as we go along. Um, there was a time where the Calgary Herald, for example, would have over 100 reporters. They're now, I think, down to about 14, and they've sold their building. Um, and there is speculation about when Post Media is going to go bankrupt. Will it be this year? Will it be next year? Will it be in the next six months? That gives you a sense of the decline uh, of the media, and especially now that Post Media owns all the papers, uh, the major papers in, in, Can uh, in, in Alberta, uh, both the Sun and the Herald and, and the Journal. So that is, that is a problem. The second is, from a policy perspective, having read both policy documents, there wasn't that much difference, with the exception of taxes, between the two. Um, where it was different was who do you believe? Uh, who do you trust? Uh, do you trust Smith on health care? Do you trust Notley on the economy? And quite frankly, that's an easier discussion to have um, than it is about policy debates. Conflict often generates uh, much better coverage than a policy uh, debate, especially given from their actual official policy, there wasn't much that separated uh, the, the, the two. Um, we are seeing the rise of alternative media, but those are not objective, neutral officials, they all have a, an axe to grind, whether that's the Western Standard or whether that's press progress. So they're preaching to the converted. They don't do a lot of investigative report, it's a lot of commentary. And so while we've seen the, the huge decline of uh, the media, um, uh, with the possible exception of CBC. I mean, yesterday CTV laid off people in TV and in radio. CBC is still functioning and in probably the strongest media outlet in the, in, in the province. Uh, but alternative media isn't picking up the slack because it's almost like the 19th century where we had very partisan presses. Uh, and I don't know where the future of the media is going to go. Social media. <laughs> Again, you're often in silos, uh, and you're just, um, you either follow the people that you like, or you follow the people that you dislike and you criticize them. Um, and, uh, and finally, I would say, look at their ads. Look at the ads for both parties, uh, which were ubiquitous wherever you went. Um, if you ignored TV, they were on YouTube. Um, you know, they were on the radio. And the NDP's ads were, Daniel Smith is horrible, vote NDP. The NDP or the UCP ads were Rachel Notley's horrible, vote for us. So the ads, the messaging that the parties had was also not about policy. It was largely demonizing the other side. So some comments on that. But I accept the correction on getting Lethbridge West and, and East Wrong. You can tell I'm not from Lethbridge. <laughs> Maureen Hawkins. Um, my question, I read in the newspaper, in some newspaper, I don't remember which, a day or two ago, that after the pandemic, oil demand from China did not go back up to where it was before, and that some people are predicting peak oil demand by 2026. Do you think this is possible? And if so, what is that going to do to the UCP? Okay. So, bullet point number two. <laughs> uh, challenges of the Smith government is the fiscal situation. Um, the rise in the price of oil was not because the pandemic ended. I think that contributed to it. But more significantly, it was the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and that led to the spike in oil. In the budget of February 2023, the UCP projected $79 barrel of oil for the rest of the fiscal year. Uh, it's currently anywhere between $70 and $72 a barrel. And you're thinking, well, $7, that's, that's pretty accurate, right? If, if your uh, restaurant bill comes and you thought it was going to be $72 and it's $79, no big deal. 
Well, you listen to economists and every dollar gap between the projected number and the real number is a drop of $650 billion, or sorry, $650 million to the provincial treasury in royalty rates. So if these prices hold for the rest of the fiscal year, Alberta will be in a deficit situation with $72 barrel of oil. Bear in mind, after the initial Kenny cuts of early 2019, we could have balanced the budget on $60 barrel of oil. So the question then becomes, what does the UCP do with that? Do they run a deficit? Well, Travis Taves introduced legislation banning deficits. I guess they could change the law, run a deficit. Do they backtrack on uh, the tax cut? I, I don't think so. That was a major plank in their campaign. Or do they make cuts to education and, and health care? Um, those are the choices that they're going to have, uh, and we'll see. I mean, the 30% the, uh, of our government revenue is now based on royalties. That's a tremendous, tremendous percentage, the highest ever. Um, in the February 2023 budget, Alberta had $28 billion in resource revenue, non-renewable resource revenue. In 20, it was either 2016 or 2017, in the Notley years, they had $5 billion. It's tough to balance the budget on $5 billion. It's easy to do it on $28 billion. But what if you expect $28 billion and you only get $21 billion? Right? Then there's going to be a fiscal situation. So let's see how they deal with that. Let's see how Nate Horner, the new finance minister, deals with that because that is a potential problem. Okay. David Amis is my name. Have you any comments ab about the really very low turnout in Alberta of voters? Um, we, we have a government which is by no means a majority government of the population. I lived in Australia for a long time and they have compulsory voting that worked very well. You didn't have to vote, didn't have to cast a vote necessarily. You just had to turn up and register and then you, you could leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> So voter, voter turnout, it really depends on what you think a high number is or a low number. So um, when we had 68% in 2019, that was the highest in 40 years. But in the 70s, we used to get mid 70% voter turnout. Dropping to 60%, is that low? Uh, not when you compare it to 55% in 2015 or 40% in 2008. Uh, I think one of the reasons voter turnout was low, and it's tough to prove, but it's, uh, I think, persuasive, is that when conservatives get cranky, and they were cranky at Stelmack in 2008, and they were cranky with Aaron O'Toole in 2021, their answer is not to vote for another party, it's to stay home. So I wonder how many conservatives stayed home in this last election, uh, particularly uh, in, the, in the Calgary uh, region. On the issue of voter turnout and mandatory voting, I know Australia has that, I know New Zealand has that. Um, I think it's up to parties to convince people to vote and to vote for them. Um, and so I think not voting is an option. Uh, you often hear, well, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Well, no, you can still complain, uh, and you will. Um, would I like voter turnout to be more, uh, to be higher? Absolutely I would. I'm not sure I want to mandate that, though. I think it, it behooves people to, to do so. And particularly what we hear is, why don't the youth vote? Okay. We'll give them a reason to vote. In 2015, Justin Trudeau got the young people to vote, and he did it based on electoral reform, which he promised but never delivered, and legalization of marijuana, which he did deliver. And the youth numbers went up, uh, but he hasn't retained the youth vote since, and neither party has been able to attract the, the youth vote. So, um, you know, if this is something that Canadians are really concerned about, then I guess we could change laws on that, but uh, I'd like to see what occurs. Uh, and I would also argue at a municipal rate, they're even lower than they are at a provincial rate. And federal rate is often higher than provinces. So some comments on voter turnout.
Thank you very much, Duane. I always look forward to your comments on elections. Francis Schultz, what I would like you to comment on is what effect did the Take Back Alberta campaign have on any of the constituencies, but particularly the rural constituencies? So I have, I, I became very concerned with Take Back Alberta uh, early on, and, and I wrote some pieces, and I gave some interviews on Take Back Alberta, and then there was some subsequent research and work that was done. We know the influence of Take Back Alberta. Um, David Parker's great insight as the founder of Take Back Alberta, typically when conservatives uh, are upset, they just form a different party. And that's the history of Alberta. The Reform Party, the Wild Rose Party, uh, the Western Canada concept to go back even further, the Alberta Alliance. What Parker's insight was, how about we take over the party from within? He formed the party in February of 2022 in opposition to Jason Kenney's uh, restrictions on COVID. And he signed up about 40,000 members to the UCP party to participate in the U UCP leadership review. If it wasn't for Take Back Alberta, Jason Kenney wins that leadership review. And the rest of our history is very different in this province. He then mobilized that same group of voters to support Daniel Smith in the leadership race. Daniel Smith would not have won the leadership race without the support of Take Back Alberta. In the fall of 2022, Take Back Alberta won every seat on the UCP executive board. Only half were up for election, the other half were up for election this fall. That tells you their power. They took over constituency boards in uh, Rocky Mountain, Rimby, Sundry, in Chestermere, Strathmore, in Livingston, McLeod, in a number of different communities. And there were lots of TBA affiliated candidates for the UCP. Jennifer Johnson, um, Chelsea Petrovic in Livingston, McLeod, uh, Bouchard in Lougheed, McDougall in uh, Calgary uh, Fish Creek. And so I was very concerned about the role of Take Back Alberta. Then I saw the cabinet. And if Daniel Smith wanted to exercise independence from Take Back Alberta, she couldn't have done it in a better way. None of those affiliated candidates are in her cabinet. And most significantly, oops. Jason Nixon is back in cabinet. Jason Nixon was targeted by Take Back Alberta as being a key lieutenant of Jason Kenney. They found a uh, opponent, Tim Hoven, to run for the UCP nomination. The UCP board at the time disqualified Tim Hoven. Tim Hoven went, uh, ran as an independent, lost badly uh, to Nixon. Nixon was left out of Smith's initial cabinet, but she brought him back in. Now he's in a very minor role compared to what he was. He's no longer government house leader and environment minister. He's minister of community and seniors and social services. But the fact that he is in cabinet against the wishes of Take Back Alberta is, I think, a demonstration of independence from Smith. Let's see if it holds up because they hold half of the board seats and they, my guess is, will likely hold all of the board seats um, in six months' time. Um, so let's watch Take Back Alberta. After people started to report on them, they scrubbed their website of all of their policy ideas. But because I had been looking at them prior to that, I know what their policy ideas are. They want um, amnesty for anyone charged or convicted over COVID offenses, and they want retribution against people like Dina Hinshaw uh, and Verna Yu of Alberta Health Services. They want to see more private health care. They want to see more private education. They're very tied into the homeschoolers, um, and uh, they want to fight Ottawa. Some of them are either separatists or, or quasi-separatists. So let's see if some of that agenda bleeds in. The Smith ran. No, on, not on those issues, but if you start to see those issues jump to the forefront, that may be an indication of the influence of Take Back Alberta, but stay tuned on that. I don't think that story is over. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, thanks very much, Dwayne, for coming to an in-person session, finally. Yeah. Great to have you. Uh, 
On the topic of uh, election participation in Denmark, where I come from originally, uh, they really get worried if it goes below 85% when they have a election. And, and the answer is proportional representation. Uh, every vote absolutely counts. So that's the way to go if we want to get more people involved. My question is, uh, we have a new minister for, for uh, uh, health, and she is uh, not in favor of uh, women being able to choose. Uh, we also have a minister who chuckled down a beer in a right in the lecture state. He's the mental health and addiction minister. Uh, and no labor minister. Uh, could you comment on, on those choices, please? Okay. So you do not want to be health minister at the best of times. <laughs> uh, and even though it's the biggest spending envelope in a province, it's always a problem. And both of the health ministers under Kenny lost. Tyler Chandra lost and Jason Copping lost. Um, I don't know how much of that was due to them personally and their job in health. For example, uh, Copping was in Calgary Varsity, where the University of Calgary is, um, a typical progressive riding. He lost. We understand that most candidates only represent 4 to 5 percent, and it's the leader and party that represent the other 95. But in Shandro's case, when you lose by 25 votes and you represent 4 to 5 percent of that, um, that may have been the, the difference. So health is always tough. I would say overall, I think um, uh, Smith put together a good cabinet on what she had, but the most controversial pick was not Nixon, it was Adriana Lagrange in health, who had a real tough time in education, um, battled the teachers, had curriculum issues, and now she's the Minister of Health. Tyler Shandro had problems with doctors and nurses. Copping, I think, was able to reach deals with those, but now you have LaGrange. And if LaGrange treats doctors and nurses the same way that she treated teachers, that's going to be a problem in the healthcare system. Um, there is no abortion law in Canada, but provinces control access to clinics, they control access to training, that's a role the Minister of Health can have. And she was not just pro-life, she led a pro-life group. There are real concerns about LaGrange in health. Uh, let's see how that plays itself out. Uh, I think it's too early, uh, but based on the track record in education, uh, I think those questions are, are warranted. Um, I'm less concerned with um, Dan Williams uh, having a beer in parliament in the legislature, I think it was bad taste, uh, but I don't think it negates you being mental health and addiction um, minister. He, him and R.J. Sigurdsson, I believe, are the only two who were not form, uh, part of either Kenny or Smith's earlier cabinet. So they're the new blood that has come in. Most of the rest of them, it was just like a cabinet shuffle, and they just moved from one step to the, to the other. Oh, Cyril Turton uh, in Spruce Grove is also a new, uh, a new minister. I will say it's a bit disappointing we lost Nick Milliken. Uh, I think Milliken was good in that role. Um, but he was in a no-win situation. I, um, uh, I won't tell you how I voted, but my wife told Milliken she really liked him but couldn't vote for him um, because of his leader. Um, and so I think others at Calgary Curry thought the, the same way, um, but that's, that's unfortunate. Uh, but you needed to have a balance between rural and urban, and it's heavy urban. I mean, there's 12 seats in Calgary controlled by the UCP. Nine of those 12 are in cabinet. Everybody else is from outside. And I believe him and Todd Lowen are the only ones from the northwest part of the province. Um, so I think that's why Dan Williams. I'm less concerned about Dan Williams than I am about Adriana LaGrange. Okay. And you're right about proportional representation. Uh, when we look at the statistics, over electoral systems, proportional representation always has a higher voter turnout than non-PR systems. Um, Trudeau ran on PR, 
and didn't deliver, I don't think anybody's about to change the electoral system anytime soon, <laughs> unless they move to Denmark. <laughs> or move back to Denmark. <laughs> Uh, Trevor Page, I've much appreciated your analysis both here and on election night via Global. Um, given the traditional split in voting between rural areas and the main urban areas, I wonder if you've looked at the demographics of the voters, particularly what young people are doing and I'd be very interested in any comment that you have as we move forward on the influence of artificial intelligence on voting in Alberta. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I will say the rural-urban split in Alberta is relatively new. Uh, in the sense that Calgary also tended to vote conservative. Um, and so I think the, the, the mapping that we saw is, is quite different. Even in 2015, when the NDP formed government and had real troubles in rural Alberta, they had seats there. Uh, those seats may have been occurring by vote split, but they did have representation. They don't have representation now, with the exception of Banff, Canada, and Ascus, which because of, of the nat National Park is not quite a typical rural riding. Um, Banff, Canada, and Ascus is a very complicated uh, place, and we saw that with the voting patterns. If you're in Banff or Canmore, you were voting NDP. If you were in Springbank or in Bragg Creek, which are just outside of Calgary and very rich areas, you, you voted UC, uh, UCP. Um, Janet and I did a deep dive, have been doing deep dives uh, for CBC looking at values in Alberta. and. Pre-COVID, there wasn't a value shift between urban and rural. Uh, there was a difference on education and religion. Um, those were big distinctions. The more educated you were, the more likely you were to vote for progressive parties, and the more often you went to church, of any church, you voted conservative, but it didn't break down on rural-urban. Post-COVID, we are seeing value shifts. Uh, and in fact, I'm working on a book with Lisa Young on the politics of COVID in Alberta, where he broke down that public opinion data, and there is clear distinction in attitudes towards COVID, rural versus urban, which then ties into attitudes around science and attitudes about other issues. And so we are seeing not just a, ch a shift in voting patterns, but a value shift, and I think that is really worrisome for governance. Um, that rural-urban split is really accentuated in the United States, which is why issues uh, on elections are not decided in cities or in rural communities, but in suburban communities around Denver, around Philadelphia, around Phoenix, uh, that, uh, around Atlanta. Those are where elections are won and lost because the cities are Democrat and the rural counties are Republican. And I fear that's where we're going now. You look federally, and the Conservatives win almost every rural riding, uh, with the exception of some in Atlantic Canada, uh, where the Liberals are still strong, and some in rural Quebec, where the Bloc Québécois is still strong. Uh, but it's very striking in Alberta. And we're also going to see this in Manitoba, which goes to the polls in the fall, where rural Manitoba will remain Conservative, largely with the exception of some parts of northern Manitoba, and Winnipeg is going to go. Uh, NDP, but this is the first time we have seen this sort of split, uh, and it's largely a Calgary split. Um, Edmonton has traditionally voted non-conservative multiple elections. Uh, artificial intelligence, too early to tell, uh, it, it, but it, it is worrisome around these deep fakes, um, you know, and uh, there are uh, videos that surfaced of um, former Justice Minister Jonathan Dennis, a Calgary councillor, um, making you know racist jokes um, from this Brockett 99 skit from the 80s, uh, and they claim that they were deep fakes. Um, all of them, 
all, all six of those videos in different places were all deep fakes? No, but it put enough doubt in people's minds to believe that they were deep fakes. And then they showed a video of Stephen Carter that clearly was a deep fake, taking credit for all of it, right? Um, so I think artificial intelligence is going to play an increasing role um, in campaigns and not for the good. Uh, it will be for, for evil. Last two questions here, guys. So make them quick. Good, Good afternoon, Dave Babel. Uh, Duane, I've uh, heard many of your presentations and I'm always leave better informed. Okay. And I hope I will today as well. Uh, the last time we had a conservative premier who lasted more than one term, I think was Peter Lougheed. Now, with the Take Back Alberta and with the polarization that you're alluding to already, how long do you think that Rachel, uh, I'm sorry, that, that uh, Daniel Smith will remain in office? Will it be possibly four years? <laughs> so, w one correction is the last Conservative Premier to win an election and run for re-election was Ralph Klein in 2001. But that's still 20 years ago. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter how many seats you won, right? They, uh, so I would get this, I would get interviews during the election campaign about how many seats does Smith need to survive? I said, well, if she wins 63 seats, she'll be pretty good. And, and then I go, but that's what Jason Kenney got. Uh, and then I go, but if he, if he does better, she does better than that. Let's say she gets 72 seats, she'll be okay. Alison Redford got 72 seats. Um, and so the Conservatives eat their young. Um, and uh, now I'm hearing it's the opposite. Because she won so narrowly, you can't get rid of her. Um, We'll see, um, and you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, I think there's a reason that Rachel Notley is sticking around, at least for a while, to see what happens. Um, because there are fissures within the Conservative Party. Um, and uh, there were clear candidates running in Calgary during the election that says vote for the party, not the leader. We will change the leader after the election. Uh, that's during the campaign. That doesn't happen to a winning candidate. Um, so let's, let's see what transpires. Um, but if I was to bet my shiny loony, I don't think Smith will be here four years from now. Um, so let, uh, but I don't know how. Um, I can tell you the, uh, and I know this is a shameless book plug, but our book called The Blue Storm, subtitle is called The Rise and Fall of Jason <laughs> Kenney. And I can tell you when we had our author's workshop presenting our draft chapters in June of 2021, nobody on that video conference ever anticipated that Jason Kenney would not have been running for re-election in 2023. And I am convinced that Jason Kenney, up until May 18th, 2022, was convinced he was running for re-election. So um, this is Alberta. Anything is possible. This will be our last question. OK. Hey. That'll be a good one, though. Yeah. Let's smile. Let's not go crazy. Okay. My name is Chris Spearman, and my question, of course, is about the relationship with municipalities, because Albertans elect uh, not only a provincial government, but uh, municipal governments in each community where they live. Yep. So uh, there was... Uh, under the NDP, uh, considerable progress and very good relationships between municipalities and the NDP government. There were city charters that were just about ready for approval when the uh, 2019 uh, provincial election was called. Uh, we were always welcome to contact cabinet ministers directly uh, on issues. We had a lot of support on uh, any, any range of issues. When the UCP got elected in 2019, the message was, we got elected and you guys are going to do what we tell you. And uh, it was uh, very, a very different relationship. Now, the UCP has been re-elected, and they have a very experienced municipal affairs minister, Rick McIver. What is your expectation in terms of the future relationship between municipalities and the new UCP government? So the first thing, uh, Chris, is I'm going to be asking you that very same question <laughs> to get your perspective. Um, 
relations were not good with the municipalities and not just with the big city mayors. Um, when Nahed Nenshi and, and Don Iveson left, they gave a West of Center podcast where both of them blasted the, the Kenny government. And you could tell they were leaving uh, because they, they clearly left things wide open. Um, they're in a problem in losing Edmonton. I don't think Smith's initial idea of advisors being the losing candidates from the UCP in Edmonton was a good idea, and she subsequently backtracked. Um, and uh, I hope that she actually speaks to Mayor Sohi uh, about that and, and the councillors. Um, Calgary, that's a bit of a mixed bag because you may recall a press conference they held days before the writ was issued with Jody Gondek and Sonia Sharp and Rick McIver celebrating the arena deal, um, which I've said a fair bit about how bad I think the arena deal is for taxpayers. Uh, great for Murray Edwards, um, but the city council voted 15 nothing in favor of that. So, uh, but I absolutely agree with you with Rick McIver, and I think that's a recognition that Daniel Smith realizes she has a problem, at least in the big cities, by bringing back Rick McIver. Rick McIver is an old hand, mm -hmm. um, and he gets things done. Yes, he negotiated the arena deal, but he was giving marching orders, which I think were something like, I don't care what it is, get it done and he got it done. Uh, he got the ring road done in Calgary. He's a former councillor, former mayor candidate, and a strong municipal affairs minister, and I think after being exiled from Smith, he's being brought back in in recognition of that. But it's not just the big cities, it's everywhere else. Think of the battles over the RCMP with AUMA. Um, and so that's a problem that the UCP government has had. There's always a tension between different orders of government, especially an order of government where the province often says, you're just the creatures of the provinces and we can treat you the way we want to treat you. Um, there was actually some back and forth where they said, you know, Mayor Sohi, you got less votes than all of the losing UCP candidates combined. Okay, I don't think that was a good outreach to the City Council of Edmonton. Uh, so I am cautiously optimistic simply because Rick McIver was put in that role. Um, but all governments have problems. You talk to the, the big cities and they go, we've been wanting a big city charter. And the provincial government says, we agree. We should have a city charter. And we're going to have Calgary and we're going to have Edmonton and we're going to bring in Chestermere too. And they're going, well, we have 1.4 million people. Chestermere has 30,000. Yeah, but they're a city too, okay? And so we do live in a diverse province. There is a difference between a mid-sized city like Lethbridge that is a regional hub versus a suburban Calgary city like Sherwood Park or Chestermere. And there's also a qualitative difference between Calgary and Edmonton. So it's a very diverse situation, um, but they seem to uh, they seem to play the heavy hand more than they do the let's consult hand. And I hope you have better answers than I do. Thank you very much, Duane. As always, a pleasure.